We looked at the wave equation, and that uh, equation tells us the relationship between uh, spatial characteristics of the uh, uh, propagating mechanical disturbance and its temporal characteristics as it uh, moves through the subsurface from one point to another. But it doesn't tell us too much about uh, how the ground is actually moving. And what we see here is a very shallow, and maybe a very is a little bit hyperbolic, but um, <clears throat> we're looking in the upper um, uh, 50, 60 meters of the uh, subsurface here. This is a, what we generally think of as a high resolution land seismic data set. It was generated using a hammer as the uh, seismic source. And <clears throat> this uh, Axis is source receiver distance, and we have time here, and this is in seconds. We have a source located over here, and then we have receivers located at each of these points out along the line. And <clears throat> you can see that um, we've got a total of 26 geophones in this record, in this uh, shot record. So we refer to this as a shot record. And these receivers are spaced uh, 10 feet apart, you know, a little over 3 meters, or about 3 meters. And uh, so we have this record of travel time out along the surface to each of these geophones of the different kinds of waves. And the um, point to highlight in this video is that waves reach points out along the surface along different paths, different types of waves uh, come to the surface at different times. We have something called a direct arrival, which is basically a wave that propagates out along the surface. It usually has a fairly low velocity, so it's, this event is labeled A here. And this is usually a, uh, oh, could be a, a compressional wave. Uh, traveling out along the surface, and uh, we have we also have what are referred to as critical refractions, and, and we'll have to uh, uh, look at these using uh, a ray path approach uh, in the future. But for right now, these are critical refractions. This is another uh, critical refraction here, and then these events which steepen at the longer offsets and become shallower at the nearer offsets are hyperbolic. It's a little bit difficult in this uh, short record to see the hyperbolic nature of these reflection events, but this would be a reflection event from a coal seam in the subsurface. And we have a, a, you know, a couple of events here. And um, this event is an air wave. So if we pick a particular time, for example, we uh, this is, makes it easy. The time here, this would be uh, 0.1 seconds. So this is 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Um, so we have about 0.15 seconds out here at about 170 feet. If we convert that into, we've got a certain distance traveled in a certain time, 0.15 seconds. This gives us about 1133 feet per second. So we can get velocity information from these linear events. Uh, we're actually seeing here with the critical refractions how quickly the, the wave travels uh, through uh, some of the deeper uh, medium uh, lying beneath the surface. So that would be about 1133 feet per second or 345 uh, meters per second. And this, so the length of this uh, spread of sources is about uh, I think I mentioned this, 260 feet or about 80 meters. We can also see from looking at the peak-to-peak -peak times here that we have peak-to-peak -peak times uh, or periods of about 0 0.005 seconds. So this is 0.01 seconds here. It's about half of this. So that gives us a dominant frequency, you know, just roughly uh, a dominant frequency of about 200 hertz. And we're going, to have, we're going to have to spend uh, considerable time actually looking at these time-distance relationships for the different events, the critical refraction, the direct arrival, 
the reflection events and, and so on the airway. And, uh, but what we're going to do now is just take a look at the various types of waves that we encounter in the uh, subsurface. Uh, the different wave types that we encounter are not all compressional. This is a compressional wave. So we can think of it as a series of weights or masses on springs. That's kind of a crude diagram here, but if we push on one end, we generate uh, compression between the particles. We can see that compression wave travel out along the uh, bar here. And then behind it, uh, we have what we refer to as a rarefaction or an extension of the uh, particles uh, in, in, in the subsurface. So uh, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction for the uh, compressional wave or P wave. And uh, for the shear wave we have this up and down motion. The shear waves are, have a, are slower than the compressional waves. But we can see that they... Now these are body waves, so these are waves that travel within the interior of an object and uh, in, within the interior of an object, within the interior of the subsurface, we can have these uh, compressional waves, and then we can also have these shear waves, or side to side or up and down motion. So the, the shear wave, it's, it's worth pointing out that we could have a side to side motion as well in the body, and uh, often shear waves, are, shear waves are polarized, so we have uh, different uh, up and down velocities in different directions and your different back and forth velocities in different directions. So a very useful wave to record and analyze. And then we also have waves which typically uh, you only see at a free surface. Uh, you can also see them at boundaries between surface in, in some instances. So we've got something here that we refer to as ground roll. It's a, a Ray, Rayleigh wave. And um, it's hard to see here, but the Rayleigh wave motion is retro, what they refer to as retrograde elliptical. It starts by moving down and then out and then up and then back uh, in a counterclockwise sense. And it's also dispersive because the amplitude of this motion and also the, um, uh, the frequency content tends to get a little bit higher with depth. Now the love wave here is a is a surface wave, and we're seeing this side to side motion. Uh, these are some of the most destructive waves in uh, earthquake size. You know, earth, when you have an earthquake, uh, these um, uh, love waves are, are very destructive because most of the uh, buildings, uh, most of the structures on the surface of the earth, are built to withstand uh, kind of the gravitational pull. So. They may deform less in response to a Rayleigh wave than they would with a side-to-side -side shaking, which, which tends to, to make structures wobble and fall apart. So we have these uh, surface waves, the Rayleigh wave and the Love wave, both of which are dispersive, so the amplitude does extend down below the surface, but it, it, it's smaller with depth and usually higher frequency. Now these are just records. Uh, we looked at a shallow... Um, shot record. These are uh, obviously uh, we're looking at a much longer period of time. We looked at about two tenths of a second in that very shallow record. Here we have three seconds. Uh, this is two-way time. It's important to note. And so this is generally when we're talking about reflections would be the time down and the time back up. <clears throat> and usually from an interpretation point of view we're interested in the reflection data. Not always, but uh, for the most part. Uh, these events here are probably um, uh, refraction, uh, critical refraction events of, of some sort uh, from a multi-layered subsurface. I don't really think we can see the direct arrival here uh, in this particular record. Uh, perhaps over here, but, but again these look like they might be critical refractions and we can see the velocity increase where the slope decreases as we go to the longer offsets. And we can see some crossing here. So this could be a refraction from a shallower interface, which uh, comes down below the refractions from faster, shallower interfaces. And again, we see this uh, hyperbolic, these hyperbolic events, which uh, are reflections.
uh, and, and we'll talk about the mathematical relationships uh, using ray trace uh, theory uh, in uh, subsequent uh, videos. But now, now these events here would be your ground roll, most likely a, uh, would be a Rayleigh wave, probably an up and down uh, retrograde elliptical wave. I don't. Uh, it's, I don't know what the distance relationships are here, so I'm not really sure whether the air wave is visible here or not. So, uh, but these are the kinds of records that you, you're usually looking at that you collect in the field. This would be a split spread, so we have geophones on either side of the source. And it's this basic data that we then uh, sort through, recombine, resort, and um, process in order to create the uh, seismic sections that you're used to seeing. So in general, the Rayleigh wave velocity is less than the love wave velocity is less than the shear wave velocity, which is less than the P wave velocity. That may not strictly be true. You know, it seems that the love wave velocity is uh, uh, velocity of a uh, surface wave, and so it could be, could be equal to the shear wave velocity and the upper medium. But uh, the love wave, like the Rayleigh wave, is dispersive, which means that it, it has large amplitude motion at the surface, and then as you go down into the subsurface, it, it, uh, the amplitude of that uh, disturbance becomes smaller and smaller, and also higher frequency. So, and you, you tend to see the uh, deeper, uh, you know, the, the waves that are the love waves that are oscillating back, or the Rayleigh waves that are oscillating back and forth at depth tend to be traveling in a faster medium. So they, they tend to arrive uh, earlier uh, than the shallower, slower velocity uh, components of those uh, waves. The shear waves, uh, they're, they're generally much faster than the uh, love wave and the Rayleigh wave. And um, so they, they generally have velocities uh, greater than the love wave, or approximately equal to or greater than the love wave. So uh, we tend to get these love, wave re love waves recorded in convention. We do not often see, I should say, the love waves recorded in conventional seismic surveys because the geophones respond to up and down motion. And remember the love wave is kind of going side to side, so it's shaking the earth back and forth side to side, so you tend not to really see the love wave unless you're using a multi-component geophone. So, uh, and vertical uh, component geophones are often used because we're interested in seeing the compressional wave. And uh, so that's the kind of data that, that uh, you're preferentially recording in most surveys and uh, to record the uh, vertical ground motion. So we don't tend to see the side-to-side -side motion, but we would see the uh, vertical uh, Rayleigh wave disturbance because it's moving the uh, surface up and down in kind of a, remember, a retrograde elliptical sense. And those of you that live in earthquake country, if you know, at night when you have a, a really small earthquake, you can feel this uh, up and down, back and forth uh, motion. It's, it's very interesting to, to feel the different wave types in earthquakes as they arrive. The, uh, Really wave, love wave, and uh, shear wave, and then the P wave. So we're going to come back um, in the next video. We'll talk a little bit about um, all the um, characteristics of the uh, seismic, uh, seismic wave as it propagates through the subsurface, uh, basic ideas of uh, period and frequency. And so uh, we'll, thanks for joining us and we'll hope to see you uh, hope to see you on the next uh, video